another card out there, the one with the, the QR code, and that will allow you up until August 31st to get 30% off of any book from the RTB website, which is called reasons.org. And because that's a small sample of the many resources that Reasons to Believe has. So if you pick this one up, you'll see the code on the bottom where you can order more books online. Uh, if you're interested in tonight's topic, for example, I think we only have about five or six copies left of tonight's topic of uh, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. But um, anyway, feel free to take advantage of those resources as well. Also, a big thank you to Grace Church. For the last four years, they have uh, wonderfully hosted Reasons to Believe here in this building, usually upstairs in the quad. And uh, tonight we came down here in the bigger room. So many thanks for uh, always bending over backwards. David Banks and Pastor Phil, thank you very much. Yes. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ross at this time. Come on up, sir. And uh, Dr. Ross is, uh, of course, well-published and uh, uh, well-respected speaker in apologetics around the world. And uh, tonight, <laughs> so tonight, sir, you have a very timely topic given this government report that recently came out. So we're all anxious to hear your thoughts on it. So thank okay. you very much. Sir. Very good. All right. Well, it's good to be with you. And yeah, we ran out of the free books. And that's why, if you want the free book, you're going to need to fill out that card so we can mail it to you. Uh, so, and uh, my background is astrophysics, and uh, I've been a pastor for the past four decades as well. And people ask me, well, what is a pastor and astrophysicist doing uh, with UFOs? And uh, it was because I was an amateur astronomer before I became a professional astronomer. Uh, many of you know my story that uh, I got captivated by astronomy and physics when I was seven years of age. Uh, I was uh, reading four or five books on astronomy and physics every week. And uh, uh, I saved up money uh, to uh, build a telescope. I actually went around, our neighborhood had a lot of drunks. So I went around the neighborhood collecting uh, beer bottles and converted that into money for a telescope mirror and wound up uh, making myself a telescope. Uh, and then I joined the uh, astronomy club in Vancouver, British Columbia. And when I was 16, they made me the director of observations for the club because I knew the night sky so well. And when I was the director of observations, I said, you know, we really need to uh, have a booth at the Pacific National Exhibition. It's the second biggest exhibition in North America. So they gave us a booth there, uh, but they put us right next door to the Flying Saucer Club. And so people would go to the Flying Saucer Club booth and they would come to our booth and say, you know, uh, uh, what do you think of what they're saying there? Or they would say, you know, I had this experience last summer where I saw this thing moving in the sky. And can you tell me what, I, what I've been seeing? And because I knew the night sky so well, I was able to identify what a lot of them thought uh, were unidentified flying objects. And uh, then what happened is when I went on to begin my undergraduate work at the University of British Columbia, the professors there figured out, hey, here's a student that actually knows the night sky. We're going to give them all the UFO reports that we get from at the university. So I wound up having the job of handling UFO reports. And then I went on to the University of Toronto. And once again, the reputation followed me. Hey, you get to take care of all the UFO reports. And then I went on to Caltech. Everywhere I've been, I was a guy who had to handle the UFO reports. So I wound up with decades of experience of uh, studying uh, UFOs. And uh, then as we were, this is actually, yeah, when we launched Reasons to Believe, I got contacted by a group that said, uh, would you consider uh, doing a speaking trip to uh, Russia? I says, uh, this is before perestroika happened. The communists were still in control, but they were concerned about their academics, especially about their scientists, because their scientists were actually going to international conferences. And the scientists were causing some problems for the communist government. And so they contacted me and a few other uh, Western research scientists who were Christians and said, would you come to the Soviet Union? We're going to pay all of your expenses when you're in the country. Uh, will you come 
and speak to our scientists, and our scientists want you to speak on science and the Christian faith. And I thought, well, this is interesting given the atheist situation, but they also said, there's one very important caveat. If we ever catch you sharing your Christian faith with someone who doesn't have a doctoral degree in the sciences, you'll be immediately uh, you know, deported and never allowed back into our country. You can, oh, and we're gonna be watching you. And so there were KGB agents that were with us making sure we didn't step out of bounds. Uh, but, uh, and they said, they get to pick the topics, not you. And so they said, please give us a list of, uh, you know, whatever topics you feel you can speak on. So I thought, well, okay, I came up with a list of 30 different lectures I could give uh, on different science faith topics. And uh, what was interesting is while I was in the Soviet Union, uh, over half of the requested talks were on UFOs and extraterrestrial life. So, and what I discovered was the incidence of people experiencing UFO encounters in the Soviet Union was way higher than anything I saw in Canada or the United States. And uh, this led to us writing a book on the topic, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. I've been told we got seven copies still at our book table over there, so any of you can get that, but hey, if we run out of the seven, again, it's the same thing. Uh, just fill up that card, uh, give us a mailing address, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll get that to you. So, and that, by the way, you heard about that discount code. That's good for all of the books and uh, DVDs and other resources we make available at uh, Reasons to Believe. Uh, but I want to begin by sharing with you uh, about the identified. I mean, 99% of what people would come to me and say, I had this UFO encounter, uh, and I got to tell you about it. 99% of them I could explain as either a natural phenomena some kind of military exercise or a hoax. And in Canada, a lot of them are hoaxes. I mean, uh, almost every undergraduate engineering school loved to generate a UFO uh, buzz. And so they would actually set up these things and uh, get things flying in the atmosphere. Uh, and these days, it's much more common that we have these hoaxes because you can buy these um, drones for not much money. And uh, you can get them doing some really weird things at night, put special lights on them. So uh, the, the UFO encounter experience has actually gone way up, but a lot of it is just simply hoaxes that people pull off uh, with their little fancy drones. Um, and, but I'll share with you what are the most common uh, identifications. Number one at the list is the planet Venus. Uh, and what people don't realize is that Venus in the morning is way brighter than it is in the evening. And I was surprised how few people in Canada and the United States have ever seen Venus, as the Bible says, the bright morning star. Uh, so it can be more than 10 times as bright in the morning than it is in the evening. In fact, I've seen Venus so bright, you can read a newspaper by it. You know, when people see Venus, and they, this is a UFO. And probably the most humorous uh, report I ever got was from the California Highway Patrol, uh, where they're reporting this object uh, to us at the observatory. And uh, they were telling me they were gaining on the UFO. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I told them, you're not going to catch up with it. You're chasing the planet Venus. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the other thing that was really common when I was in Canada is people would say, I see these seven spaceships coming over the horizon. Well, Canada is a high enough latitude that the Pleiades star cluster, when it's rising, just hovers over the horizon, and it kind of rises level to the horizon for about an hour. So a lot of the reports I got were the star cluster, the Pleiades. But I also got used to asking people, okay, you saw these uh, bright uh, lights on the horizon. Where were you when you saw those bright lights? And in particular, were you inside? And they said, well, yeah, why do you ask? Uh, well, was there a pane of glass between you and what you saw on the horizon? Well, yeah, yes. Uh, was there a chandelier behind you? Okay, it's a chandelier effect. You know, with the glass there, you're gonna get an image projected on the horizon showing these little bright balls, and it's just the, uh, and if the glass 
uh, is not high quality. It's going to be kind of fuzzy. Some people say, I see these fuzzy bright balls. And I realize, well, okay, your plane of glass isn't the greatest. And uh, it's generating that effect. So, uh, but I've also seen uh, more strange things happen. Uh, for example, where um, this fast-moving object would be zipping through the atmosphere and stop and hover. In fact, that actually happened to me when I was doing observations at the Algonquin Radio Observatory. <coughs> this thing came roaring across the sky and stopped right over our telescope, and it was actually causing problems with our observations. And we kind of figured it out, okay, NORAD, which is the headquarters of the North American Air Defense, uh, that was in uh, North Bay, uh, which was just 80 miles away from our telescope. And so we figured, okay, this has got to be some NORAD thing. So uh, we called the uh, Air Force and they said, no way do we have any kind of aircraft with that capability. Because we basically said, could you please have your pilots not hover over our telescope? And keep in mind, uh, this is the uh, late 1960s, and uh, they insisted that they had no aircraft of that capability. But we found a way around it. We said, well, if you're not going to help us, uh, we'll contact the Ottawa newspapers. And they said, well, don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> and so they said, don't worry, it's not going to happen again. Well, about a decade later, we found out that Britain and the United States were working together to develop these jet aircraft that could actually stop and hover. They're called Harrier jump jets. Well, back then, they didn't want anybody to know they had that kind of technology. That's just one example of how the military does things that they don't want you to find out about. And of course, that's the reason why there's so much interest in Area 51. It's like, okay, here's this uh, secret Air Force base, and that's where they're hiding UFOs. And, uh, so many people have been uh, penetrating Area 51 that the United States Air Force said, okay, we're going to solve this. They doubled the size of Area 51. And actually, I can tell you, having worked uh, with or spoken to these Air Force people, that's not the really black ops site. Uh, I won't tell you what the black ops site is, uh, but there's actually a base in California where the, the really secret stuff is going on. But they're quite happy having everybody worry about Area 51. So, okay, if they all focus on Area 51, they're not going to discover what we're really up to. So, military, uh, that goes on, and of course, a lot of them are hoaxes. But over the decades, we discovered that there was a 1% residual. A 1% residual that could not be explained as uh, you know, natural phenomena. Oh, by the way, a really big one, I've had to ask people, okay, when you had this UFO encounter, how long were you outside in the dark? And they say, well, about 10 minutes. And I said, well, you didn't really have a UFO encounter. Our eyes take 20 minutes to dark adapt, and some people it takes 30 minutes. And during that 20 to 30 minute window, your eyes will see bright objects in the sky where they're not there. And that's just because of the dark adaptation. You've been inside, You've been exposed to bright lighting, and I've had that experience myself, because I'm a, you know, I, I have a, my own little telescope, and I realize that for the first 20 or 30 minutes, my eyes are going to be fooling me. And so, you know, wait, and so I would ask them, were your eyes fully dark adapted? And they say no, and I say, okay, I know what was going on. And of course, there's phenomena that happens when you're in swampy regions, and uh, you know, people have reported uh, clusters of fireflies. I mean, there's, there's phenomena like that. But I want to talk to you about the 1% residual. And uh, we're talking millions of documented cases. I mean, I mentioned the Soviet Union. Uh, within the Soviet Union, by itself, it had over 5 million documented cases of people having UFO experiences that didn't fall in that 99% category. So it's a huge database. I mean, when I was at the University of Toronto, I had Carl Sagan uh, for a week as a professor, and he was very dismissive of UFOs, but he was not aware of the extent of the database. He assumed there was only a few people having these kinds of reports, 
and that therefore this is something we shouldn't be believing. But it really is now north of 20 million sightings. So it's a, it's a huge database. Now, a lot of the data is not that helpful. You know, people will typically say, I saw this thing coming through the atmosphere at a high velocity, and then it stopped and hovered. And it's like, well, if you're the only observer, we can't really tell how fast the object was moving. But there are situations where they are able to triangulate, where they got multiple observers seeing the thing pass through the atmosphere, then we can actually determine what was the path of the entry through the atmosphere, how fast it was moving. And uh, what's really interesting is the speed of motion has been going up uh, through the decades. So uh, back around 1900, 1910, uh, the UFOs were reported at moving at 100 miles an hour. Uh, then in World War II, they were the Foo Fighters that were moving at about the speed of sound. Uh, then when you get to about uh, 1960, uh, they're moving at 6,000 miles an hour. And the velocity's been going up where you're able to triangulate. Now they got them going as fast as 25,000 miles an hour. So that kind of got me as I've been studying this over the decades. They seem to be keeping pace with our technology. And then there are people who have these close encounters. You're probably aware of Alan Hynek. He was assigned by the US government to do a thorough research of the UFO phenomena. This is in the 1960s and early 1970s. He's passed away, but he was the one that coined the term close encounters. Uh, close encounters of the first kind, close encounters of the second kind, the third kind, the fourth kind. And a close encounter of the first kind is where you have this 1% residual where the human has an encounter with a UFO within 500 feet or less. So we're talking a close encounter. And, uh, you know, uh, with the second encounter, they actually see uh, phenomena uh, like the thing crashing into the earth. Uh, and then close encounters of the third kind is uh, where there's communication going on, where they claim to get a communication from beings that are on board this craft. Uh, and then of the fourth kind is where there's serious injury or death. So uh, that kind of gives you, and the, depending who you read, there's three kinds of close encounters, four kinds or five kinds. Uh, but it's kind of like the closer you get, uh, and people claim to have been abducted on board these craft. That's another category of a close encounter. But anything closer than 500 feet uh, meets Alan Hynek's close encounter category. Um, and where we do have triangulation, and we can see the velocity coming through, you know, I was mentioning they keep pace with our technology. They keep pace in another way where there's actually a message being communicated from the UFO not or the UFO being to the human being, they're keeping pace with the lay level of astrophysical knowledge. So again, going back to 1900, the story was we are beings from the backside of the moon. But then the public got educated enough to realize life is not possible on the backside of the moon. And so the new story was, well, we're from Venus. And then when the public became aware of how hot it is on the surface of Venus, they said, we're from Mars. Uh, and that takes you back to about the 1990s. The story we're getting now is that they're from a distant planetary system. So they've crossed interstellar space. Because the general public now realizes the only planet that's habitable in our solar system uh, is our planet Earth. So they must be from another planetary system. And they're now saying distant planetary system because, again, the public is aware there's no nearby uh, systems uh, where intelligent life is possible. So that's kind of the story uh, that's out there. But that's an important data point. Why are they keeping pace with our technology? Why are they keeping pace uh, with our understanding of what's going on in astronomy? The other thing that was really interesting, the story of where they're from, uh, it was some, it's sufficient to convince the lay public, but not sufficient to convince the astronomers and physicists. So back in 1900, the astronomers and physicists realized backside of the moon is not credible. 
And so there were people at that educational level who realized this is not correct science that we're receiving through these communications. But the vast majority of people uh, were taken in uh, by that uh, comment. But probably the most significant data points of, of this is that when they were able to track them going through the atmosphere where we got triangulation and they're moving at these very high velocities, 9,000 miles an hour, 15,000 miles an hour, up to 26,000 miles an hour, there's not a single sighted case where they see heat friction or they hear a sonic boom. That's a very important data point. No sonic boom, no evidence of heat friction. I've had the opportunity to watch uh, one of those, um, oh, uh, the, the Challenger, what do you call it, the, the spaceships? That, the space shuttle, yeah, space shuttle. I've seen a couple of space shuttles go through the atmosphere because one of the landing places is uh, where we are in Southern California. And when it goes through the atmosphere, you see this bright glow uh, of heat friction as it encounters the atmosphere. In fact, that's what's kind of fun. You kind of can track the space shuttle, and the moment it hits our atmosphere, you see this bright glow. And you get to hear a double sonic boom, and uh, it's quite dramatic. But with the UFOs, never is there a sonic boom, no heat friction. And now there's more than 2,000 documented cases where people have been able to track the UFO going through the atmosphere and it crashing into the Earth. And you can actually go to these crash sites and what do you see at the crash site? You see a shallow depression. It's not a deep crater. The crater typically measures anywhere from four inches to 16 inches deep. But it is a crater. And uh, if there's snow in the ground, the snow is melted. And always the vegetation is damaged. But then when you go to the crash site, there's no debris, there's no artifacts. Okay, we all know what happens uh, when an aircraft crashes into the earth. You go there, you can recover the black box, and there's all kinds of debris lying around. With the UFOs, there's nothing. Nothing to recover. Now, you'll hear lots of stories in the UFO literature of how they've recovered pieces of the UFO spacecraft, or they've even got bodies that our US government is uh, covering up, which is one reason for our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. We had Dr. Mark Clark come in as a co-author. Mark Clark is a national securities expert. Uh, he was with the Reagan administration, and he's now the chairman of the Department of uh, National Security Studies at the University of California, San Diego State, or San Bernardino State. And uh, the, the reason why we had him write a couple of chapters in our book is to dispel this idea that the governments of the world are covering up the physical data of UFOs. And he basically makes the point, national security in the United States is not up to the task. The idea that our government has covered up the body where he remains of UFO beings and their spaceship in some secret place outside of Roswell, New Mexico, he says, well, here's the evidence. <coughs> we had a US president with all the power of the presidency behind him and he tried to cover up an 11-minute segment of an audio cassette tape. How many days was he able to keep that covered up uh, from the public? And it was only a few days. So the idea that our U.S. government has the security capability of covering up uh, four UFO bodies in a secret hangar along with their spaceship, he says there's no credibility to that. And he basically makes the point, look, I've studied Soviet security. It's a whole lot better than our security, but even Soviet security is not up to the task. That was important uh, when I was visiting the Soviet Union, because that was a rumor running all over the Soviet Union, that the Soviet government was covering up the real hard evidence of this. And I was able to share with the scientists there. I think it was a good thing they only let me speak to scientists, because uh, they were aware, yeah, uh, when we look at how how many mistakes our government makes, they're not going to be able to cover it up either. We know the U.S. government can't do it, our government can't do it either. So, uh, yeah, so I'm here to tell you there is zero physical evidence of uh, beings in physical craft. 
And I wrote a chapter in Lights in the Sky on Little Green Men, basically making the point is that the story now is that they're from a distant planetary system. And that immediately tells us we're not being visited by physical beings traveling to us in a spaceship. And I made a comment about this uh, yesterday. Uh, but even in that book written a few years ago, I was making the point uh, that uh, when you watch these uh, movies of these spaceships uh, moving at warp 9, warp 8. Uh, the laws of physics are such you're not going to be able to go warp 1. And that means traveling at the velocity of light. However, uh, a colleague of ours is part of our scholar community at Reasons to Believe. He's the chairman of the physics department at uh, uh, Baylor University. And uh, we interviewed him and he says, we found a way to go faster than the velocity of light. Not a lot faster, but one or two percent faster than the velocity of light. And how you do it, you gravitationally distort the space-time fabric of the universe. And so if we can uh, expend enough energy that we can uh, distort the space fabric just above the spaceship, we can move about two or three percent faster than the velocity of light. Uh, but I asked them, I said, okay, how much energy do you have to expend to be able to warp the space-time fabric sufficiently, you can go a little bit faster than the velocity of light. It says, oh yeah, that's, that's in our research paper. You need to convert the mass of Jupiter into pure energy every second <laughs> to make that happen. So you're not going to be able to go warp one. Moreover, there's another problem. The faster the velocity you move through interstellar space, the more damage you're going to do to your spaceship from the particles that are there. Now, it is true that interstellar space is essentially a vacuum, but there are particles there. Uh, there's at least one proton every cubic centimeter. And so that's not a lot, but when you're moving at 10% of velocity of light, that particle is hitting your spaceship and doing a lot of damage. And yet I'm aware that uh, there could be civilizations that are far more advanced than us, but however advanced they are, they're subject to the laws of physics. And then the, the laws of physics basically say, if you've got a physical craft, it's going to get damaged by those particles. And they say, uh, if you go, say, 20% of velocity light, the damage is going to be four times greater because the damage goes up with the square of the velocity. And so people have figured out, and I wrote in uh, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, maximum velocity you could travel if you're trying to put beings our size inside of a spaceship is about 1% the velocity of light. And uh, we've already determined uh, through searches for extraterrestrial intelligent uh, life, there's nothing within 250 light years, uh, which means you're looking at 25,000 years to make a one-way trip. Okay, that is significant because there's been numerous papers published in the scientific literature that the maximum time any intelligent civilization that's subject to the laws of physics, can maintain a level of technology equivalent to what we had post-World War II is 2,000 years. Anything longer than 2,000 years is not sustainable. So if you've got a trip that takes longer than 2,000 years, it's not going to happen. Well, it turns out I was way too conservative in that book. You cannot go 1% of velocity of light. You've got to go slower. And this is all the result of a study done a couple of years ago uh, what would it take for us to send spaceships, not spaceships with people on it, but just spaceships, machines, to the nearest star? And the excitement is the nearest star has a planet orbiting it. And I can already tell you, we know enough about that planet that it's not a candidate for life. But astronomers are saying it's only four and a quarter light years away. We could actually visit that planet and learn things about that planet we'll never learn just through looking at it through telescopes. So there's actually a mission that's being planned right now to visit that nearest exoplanet. Uh, but they quickly realize what it's going to take to send a machine uh, to visit that planet and send back information that's worthwhile. And uh, they quickly figured out, okay, if we send a big spaceship, it's going to get destroyed by the particles. It's got to be a small enough spaceship that it can escape uh, particle destruction. <coughs> and they've determined that the largest spaceship they can send is 10 centimeters across. 
Anything bigger than 10 centimeters will be destroyed before it gets there. And even when it's 10 centimeters, the odds aren't good. So the plan that's being proposed to be funded by U.S. taxpayers is to send 1,000 spaceships to the nearest star where each spaceship is no bigger than 10 centimeters with the expectation that at least half of them will be destroyed. The other half will be damaged, but they'll be damaged in different ways. And so enough spaceships will get there that they will be able to send back useful information to planet Earth. Mind you, it's going to take four and a quarter years for the information to be transmitted back. Uh, but this is a serious mission that's being planned. And as an astronomer, I'm all in favor of it because we can actually put stuff in that 10 centimeter capsule that's going to give us information we're not going to get any other way. And incidentally, it's relatively cheap. And they found a way to mass produce these 10 centimeter diameter uh, spaceships. And uh, the propulsion is also cheap. So don't worry too much about, uh, it's way cheaper than the James Webb Telescope uh, by a factor of 10,000 times. So, uh, but that basically tells us whatever's behind the UFO phenomena, they're not physical beings like us. It's something else. Uh, but the real evidence, and this incidentally, uh, I cite six other physicists and lights in the sky little green men and these are physicists like me who have spent a minimum of 10 years researching the UFO phenomenon. They all agree that we're dealing with something that's real but not physical. Real because we got the craters. We can see the melted snow. We can see the damaged vegetation. But not physical because there's no sonic boom. Uh, there is uh, no heat friction and we go to the site there's nothing physical that we can recover. And with all these 20 million documented cases, no one has ever been able to produce any physical evidence. But clearly it's real. Something caused those craters. Uh, something melted the snow. Something damaged the vegetation. And you know, people have been harmed by these UFO encounters. It's not benign. Uh, and this is what I think is really interesting as well, is when you look at the close encounter database, the best you're going to come away with is recurring, terrifying nightmares. Everyone has had one of these close encounters. They've had deleterious effects. Zero percent evidence that it's ever beneficial. So the best you're going to come away with, so well, what's the worst you're going to come away with? The worst is you get killed by the phenomena. People have been killed by these uh, close UFO encounters. And it's not just people. There's many documented, hundreds of documented cases where the animals that are associated with these people also get injured or killed. Uh, but it's only animals that are bonded to the human owner. So like their cow, their dog, uh, their cat, their horse. Um, and often the animal sees the UFO encounter first and the human sees it again. But the only time animals are affected is when the animals are strongly bonded to the human that also experiences the encounter. That too is an important data point. Um, and then when you look at these close encounters where there's messages, uh, the messages only happen to people who are deeply involved in the occult. There is no evidence of people having a message being sent to them by a UFO craft or a UFO being uh, where the individual has not been deeply involved in the occult. Which is why we close our book off. In Lights and Sky and Little Green Men, we say we are presenting a testable model of UFOs. Testable in this sense. There's a direct correlation between the close encounters and the degree of occult activity that the people who have these encounters. And it explained to me why so many more people in the Soviet Union were having the encounters and here in America, and why the level of encounters in, the, in Russia today has plummeted. It's nowhere near what it was like during the Soviet era. And, uh, you know, I was only allowed to speak to scientists who had doctoral degrees when I was in the Soviet Union, but as I visited their institutions, I saw that every one of them had a department of occult physics. And the Russians were well aware that they were way behind 
uh, the United States in terms of technology. Where they thought they could get an edge on us militarily is through occult physics. These departments of occult physics were tasked with finding new weapons. So their goal was to come up with occult weapons that they could use against the West. Well, they never really produced any. Yeah, paranormal. Um, and what I discovered is a lot of the audiences, the physicists I was speaking to in the Soviet Union, uh, there was one audience I spoke to where at least a quarter of them were demon possessed. Now, I'll say this about demon possession. Uh, I tell people, hey, if you're a Christian and you run into it, deal with it, but don't seek it out. Uh, I believe the demons want to distract us. But if, you, if you're confronted with it, you've got to deal with it. And they say, well, were these really demon-possessed people? I would walk into the auditorium, and even before I was introduced or the topic was announced, they'd be jumping up and screaming obscenities at me. <coughs> and not just at me, obscenities at Jesus Christ. And they'd be accusing Jesus Christ of the most vile behavior. Now, I've run into longshoremen that take the Lord's name in vain, uh, but they restrain themselves from accusing Jesus, for example, of being a serial homosexual rapist. You get that from demon-possessed people. Uh, or I would walk into the auditorium, and they would run away and cower in the background and kind of curl up into the fetal position. Uh, normal people don't do that. Uh, and these are people with doctoral degrees. And it's like everybody else in the audience knew they were demon-possessed. They saw so much of this, they knew exactly what was going on. It's rare in the United States. The reason why it's rare is there's so few of us that are that deeply involved in the occult. Uh, I did get to see some of it at Caltech, because there were a couple of physicists, in fact, there are famous physicists, that were secretly involved in occult work. In fact, one of them actually knew some of these Soviet scientists and says, hey, this sounds like something worthwhile investigating. And he was having experiences he wished he didn't have. So it does exist here, but it's rare. But there it was common. And that's something else we see in the database. A lot of this goes on in Equatorial Brazil. A lot of this goes on in France. But France and Equatorial Brazil is where you've got a significant percentage of the population that are significantly involved in the occult, witchcraft, paranormal, etc. And as I've traveled around the United States, there's two states where I've been able to see a significantly greater number of people reporting these kinds of phenomena, Hawaii and Alaska. But Hawaii and Alaska is where you also have a higher percentage of people involved in the occult. So that's one of the claims we make in our book. There's a direct correlation between the degree of occult involvement and these UFO experiences, these UFO encounters, and especially where people have a close enough encounter that they're getting a message uh, from uh, these uh, beings. But we also close our book off by saying, if you will take the steps to eliminate the occult from your life, that will be the end of your UFO encounters. And this book has been out for, gee, 18 years now. And I've challenged people, okay, uh, Try this and let me know if it doesn't work. <coughs> it works. Close the doors of the occult. Now, there's one important caveat. You can have these UFO encounters if there's a close relative to you that's deep into the occult and you've not confessed what they are doing as something that violates God's will for us. Um, I had some of that in my own family. And uh, it's important that we acknowledge before God, hey, what's going on in my family is something that you don't approve of and I don't approve of. That will cut the link. Uh, but demons do work through close relatives. So I've run into people who say, I got no occult involvement. And so I ask them a lot of questions. And I find out, for example, they have a sexual relationship with a witch. And I say, well, guess what? That, that's your door. Uh, you need to break that relationship off. And they say, oh, okay, I'll take care of that. And then suddenly the UFO encounters uh, go away. <coughs> Let me say a little bit about the messages that people get. There are documented cases uh, where people have a close encounter and they go into a trance. And when they go into a trance, 
they actually begin to write. So they're, they're not conscious of what's going on. They're in this trance-like state, uh, but they're on a computer or a typewriter or they're handwriting something. Probably the most famous example of that is something called the Orontia book. It's kind of the Bible of four different uh, UFO religions. And yes, there are UFO r religions that are operating around the world. And uh, they have hundreds of thousands of uh, people who are part of those uh, cults. <coughs> Which is why I had another author uh, work on this book with me, Kenneth Samples. He's a cult expert. And so he writes the chapter on the UFO religions, the UFO cults. Uh, but probably the best example is the Orontia book. 4,000 pages compose when a person was in a trance, also known as automatic writing, uh, where the human author uh, doesn't know what they're writing. They go into this trance-like state, and out comes this book. Well, if you look at the Orontia book, <coughs> and I say 4,000 pages, there's different editions. Some editions are as short as 1,000 pages. The print is tiny, uh, but it's a big book. But a third of the content of the Orontia book is denying the deity of Jesus Christ. So that's the other thing we see. There's, there's a, there seems to be a commonality to this UFO phenomena where they're intent on diverting people away from the Christian faith. Or they're trying to encourage people to pursue power and abandon truth. Uh, often in these UFO encounters, the so-called UFO beings are promising certain powers uh, to the human encounter. Uh, but as a result, they wind up being possessed by a demon or they wind up believing things that simply are not true. And uh, again, a lot of people are injured and killed. But one of the things I've learned just in my experience uh, with witchcraft and demons uh, is that their goal is to get you to end your life uh, before you give your life to Jesus Christ. And so there's a lot of suicides going on uh, in these close encounters uh, with UFOs. Now, in terms of the latest data release from our US government, and by the way, other governments are following suit, <coughs> and there's always been classified UFO documents, but what's happening in the news is a lot more of those classified documents are being released. And I think what's, per, what's new in those documents, we've reported previously in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, is that you've got, pilot, you've got credible people having these UFO encounters, uh, astronauts, pilots, uh, scientists that are having these encounters. And uh, uh, what's often, though, is that you'll see these photographs, and you've got a photograph of the UFO, but you ask the human observer, did you see it? No, but I photographed it. Or you got uh, people on naval ships where they get a radar bounce, but nothing shows up in photographic film. Uh, or they see it, and they try to get a radar bounce, and nothing happens. And so we got these multiple detection methods, but they're not consistent. Not all the instruments pick up the UFO. Some of them do, and some of them don't. But again, that's what you'd expect if you're dealing with something that's not physical, but real. But I think some of the more spectacular latest releases are saying, we got both a radar bounce and we got a photograph. But then they don't have a visual sighting. So they're now finding uh, cases where they got multiple detections, but again, what's consistent, not all the detection devices uh, pick it up. So again, non-physical reality. The physicist that's devoted the most time to studying UFOs is Jacques Vallée. He's a French astrophysicist. He has spent 60 years studying the UFO phenomena. He's basically devoted his entire life to studying the UFO phenomena. I've read his books. What he reports is credible. He's the one that studied the database to the greatest extent. Uh, but his conclusion is, and he's not a Christian, he's not even a theist, but he says if what we're dealing with is interdimensional phenomena. This is phenomena coming from dimensions beyond the space-time dimensions of the universe. He says they're real beings, but they're not part of our dimensions. They're not subject to our laws of physics. And I think, again, he's not a theist, he's not a Christian, but I agree with him. We are dealing with an interdimensional phenomena. We're dealing with beings that are not subject to our laws of physics, 
But when you read the Bible, it tells us that God created two distinct species of intelligent life. Human beings that are constrained by the space-time dimensions of the universe and the laws of physics that govern the universe, and then there are angels that are not subject to our space-time dimensions and are not subject uh, to our laws of physics. And uh, they can come into our realm, we cannot go into their realm. And as it tells us in Hebrews 13 too, many of you have entertained angels unawares. But there again, I wanna make a distinction. I believe that passage is referring to the righteous angels. The UFO phenomena is referring to the non-righteous angels. That's something else that you see in all the books that have been published by physicists and astronomers who devoted a minimum of a decade of researching this phenomena. They all agree that we're dealing with an interdimensional phenomena, interdimensional beings, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to what we see in the UFO phenomena and what we see in witchcraft and demonology. And they'll say, I'm the only one of all the authors uh, that's a Christian. They're not theists. Uh, but they say, whatever's behind the occult is also behind UFOs. Whatever's behind demonology is also behind UFOs. There's a one-to-one -one <coughs> correspondence of uh, what's uh, going on there. And I'll tell you a personal story. Uh, you know, when I was a graduate student, I was logging 1,500 hours of observing time on the telescopes per year. And uh, there were two astronomers from York University who would come up for a four-hour observing run once a year. Uh, but every time they came up for an observing run, they saw UFOs. Uh, and in my entire five-year career of making all these observations, I never saw a UFO. But every time they came in the telescope, they saw a UFO. And there was a couple of other graduate students who were also logging more than 1,000 hours a year. I said, what about you? And they said, well, we're not seeing anything. Uh, and there's one astronomer uh, in here in America that actually did a survey of observing astronomers all over North America about the UFO phenomena. And I've cited his work, basically making the point there are astronomers that do have UFO encounters, but every one of them is deeply involved in the occult. I knew these two astronomers, and I knew they were deeply involved in the occult, so I was not at all surprised they were seeing UFOs uh, every time uh, they came on the telescope. But the vast majority of astronomers see nothing. That's interesting, too, because when you look at the UFO database, the vast majority of UFO encounters happen between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning, and they happen on lonely country roads. Well, where do astronomers hang out? Lonely country roads between 2 and 4 a.m. in the morning, and the vast majority of them see nothing. So, and again, uh, from a perspective of this being a phenomena uh, that's explained by demons, we would anticipate they would visit at night. Uh, this is a time when they can have the greatest impact on their human contactees. Now, in terms of the uh, abductee phenomena, uh, there are people who claim that they not only have been uh, contacted by UFO beings, that they've been taken up onto their spacecraft. But those are the individuals that are the most deeply involved in the occult. And uh, again, there's thousands of cases of people who claim to be abducted, uh, but when you actually uh, question them, they cannot produce any physical evidence that they're actually on board the craft. A lot of them claim to have been uh, you know, sexually violated, uh, but again, they can't really prove that there's any physical evidence of uh, that kind of sexual violation. So again, this is consistent. We're dealing with something that's non-physical, uh, but real. And it's dangerous and it's evil. So I'm gonna stop there. I'll take whatever questions you got. And by the way, this is my last uh, lecture here on this trip to St. Louis. I'll take questions on any subject. It doesn't have to be. And by the way, we're live streaming this event. It's being recorded. So uh, if you wanna review what, you can get the recording of this later or share with other people. Uh, we have uh, Brian over here live streaming. So he'll be taking questions from the live stream audience. But here's what we're gonna do. We'll start with a question from you, 
And if Brian's got a question, then we'll take, we'll kind of alternate between the live stream audience and the live audience here. Yeah, we're, we've, we've stopped the recording now. I think we're going to record the questions, aren't we? Anyway, I don't know what the story is on the recording. <laughs> Tippy says, yes, we are recording. We are recording, good. We'll get the Q&A then. <laughs> what I'd like to do is if you have a question, come down. If you have a question, we'll take them on this side. And as, as Dr. Ross said, we will in, kind of bounce back and forth. Brian gets a question, we get a question, so. Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, um, I've studied this a lot and read books about it and everything, and uh, a lot of people that have studied it agree with what you're saying, that it, but because just think about it, you have the space station, it's been up there 20 years, and why don't they just pull right up there? I mean, it seems to be a, a, a cat and mouse game. I'm over here and I'm over there. Like they're trying to deceive mankind. And uh, Carl Sagan, he was an atheist, right? Uh, Carl Sagan, I said I had him briefly as a professor. And uh, when I had him as a professor, he was a very much a public uh, atheist. I'm not sure he died an atheist. Because okay. uh, a physicist that actually works for us had reasons to believe, Dave Rogstad, knew him better than I did. And the last two years of his life, they had an email exchange. And... Uh, what was interesting is Dave Rogstad said to Carl, look, uh, you know you're only going to have less than two years to live. There's a possibility I'm right and you're wrong. How about if I help you with the test I think you're going to have to pass uh, once you go from this life to the next life? And they had a really interesting exchange. And in the last six months of his life, Carl said, because Dave said, how about if we get a number of Christians praying for you? And he says, yeah, I would like that. So who knows what happened in the last few months of his well, life? What, what about the physical? I mean, there's a lot of videos. Of, it seems saying uh, these objects, some of these I'm objects. I'm having a hard physical. time hearing you. Can you put the mic Some of these place? objects seem to be physical. What about the Navy released um, the videos of the Tic Tacs? And these pilots are exclaiming how they're, they're tilting, they're doing impossible things, and so they go into the water, no splash. And what about cases like uh, the Walton, the woodsman in Arizona? There were seven of them. They've all taken lie detector tests. That whole story. It seems to be physical evidence. No, the, I, I, I'm agreeing with you. These experiences are real. Uh, my point is that they're not physical. Uh, they're not able to recover any artifacts. But people are having real experiences. And yes, uh, there are credible pilots and, uh, you know, on both ships and aircraft that have seen these craft do amazing things. And uh, another piece of evidence we're dealing with something non-physical, and this particularly comes from the latest data release, is how uh, these UFOs, they're able to see them moving at, say, 13,000 miles an hour, and they do this. They make a sharp right-angle turn. No physical object can survive that acute of an angle turn uh, at that velocity. Uh, you know, drones can do it, but drones are moving at slow velocities. The faster the velocity you do and the sharper the turn you take, the more damage you're going to do. And what the pilots uh, report is that these things that they're seeing, they're able to survive a sharp turn or they're able to see the craft going thousands of miles per hour and they stop dead and then they take off again. Physical objects can't do that. Uh, yeah, well, we did have a question about the fighter pilots who have tracked that stuff, but it seems like you just answered it. So actually, I have a question for Hugh, if I can ask that. Uh, so Hugh, as you know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I think everything in those movies is scientifically possible. So can you tell me why you constantly put those movies down? <laughs> well, I'll begin with this. I have actually seen three of the Star Wars movies, the first three. Uh, but I understand all of them begin with this panel coming up with this text on it, a galaxy far, far away. And uh, last, uh, no, it was, uh, when I was in Columbia a few days ago, I showed people all the galaxies we astronomers have been able to detect nearby and far, far away. And I showed the best galaxies we've found that could be candidates for advanced life. None of them look anything like 
our Milky Way galaxy. None of them are even close to being a candidate to host advanced life. So I've been joking with Brian saying, we need to change those Star Wars scripts. It can't be a galaxy far, far away. It's got to be our galaxy. But the problem with our galaxy, there's only one location within our galaxy uh, where advanced life is possible. And I'll give you one guess as to where that location is. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I think it's a great story. So I can see why the Star Wars thing is so popular. But I'll tell you this, I have a hard time watching science fiction movies where they violate the laws of physics more than four <laughs> times per minute. <laughs> One time per minute I can handle, but not four times per minute. I'd like to talk about Genesis 6, 4, sure. where it talks about the Nephilim, the fall, possibly the fallen angels having a relationship with women before the flood, and then also Genesis 6, 4 says after the flood. And does that set the stage for increased interaction in the end times? In Revelations, it talks about a third of the evil angels being swept down from the heavens, and they reinforce the evil reign of the Antichrist. So in a few simple words, uh, that's kind of an interesting thing that Chuck Mitzler has been talking about and talked about till his death. Could you elaborate a little bit? Well, I did devote a whole chapter and an appendix in my book, Navigating Genesis, on the Nephilim. And it's in Genesis 6-2 and 6-4. And you're right, the text tells us that the sons of God had intercourse with the daughters of men. Uh, and uh, this happened before the flood and after the flood and gave rise to the Nephilim. Uh, the Nephilim were not numerous, either before the flood or after the flood. Uh, but people have speculated that one purpose for the flood of Noah was to eradicate the Nephilim. But that tells us the sons of God came back. And what I do in uh, navigating Genesis is uh, pr give you the three most theologically credible interpretations of the sons of God and the Nephilim. There are three that are out there that you can find reputable Bible scholars that believe. And what I do in the book is give you the strengths and the weaknesses of all three explanations. But the three explanations are as follows. One you already mentioned. These are demons that are impregnating human women. The other one is that they're demon-possessed men that are impregnating women. The other one is that the uh, sons of Seth uh, were having intercourse with the daughters of Cain, which apparently they speculate was forbidden. Those are the three theories out there. Um, and uh, people uh, like Chuck Missler, I know Chuck, by the way, he's passed away, uh, but uh, I knew him when he was alive. And uh, he led one of our board members to Christ, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, but I do disagree with them that the Nephilim are a phenomenon we need to be concerned about today. Uh, the flood of Noah wiped out the Nephilim previous to the flood. Uh, the 30 mighty men of David wiped out the Nephilim after the flood. Uh, there is an interesting reference that you'll see in the book of Revelation, uh, you know, chapter 16, where it says that God is going to release the demons that are imprisoned in the abyss and allow them for five months to torment men. And uh, basically saying, hey, uh, you think these demons are friendly? Let me show you what the really nasty ones are like. And hopefully, in kind of the context of Revelation, this is going to shake people to their senses and realize, eh, this is not what I really want. So, uh, and I put this in the context that God gives to every human being a choice of where they want to spend eternity. We can spend eternity with God, but if you want nothing to do with God, he's got another place for you. And we all get to choose where we want to go. Uh, this idea that God sends us to heaven or sends us to hell, he gives us a free will. We get to choose where we want to go. Amen. Uh, Hugh, what is your take on the book of Enoch and the Watchers? My take on Enoch and the Watchers? Well, uh, I think there was a movie produced a few years ago about that, about Noah. And it talked about uh, this, these Watchers. And it's a speculation you see uh, within Jewish mythology. Uh, there's references you see in the Kabbalah to this about how there's these Watchers and there's a lot of speculation about whether the watchers are demons or demon-possessed people or some other creature that God created. 
and, uh, and the idea about the Book of Enoch. I take the position that the Book of Enoch is not part of inspired scripture. Uh, the manuscripts are late, so uh, uh, I know Enoch is mentioned in the Bible, but the idea that Enoch wrote a book, I don't see any credibility to that at all. There's no evidence for written language being that early. And the very fact that the manuscripts that claim to be from Enoch are so late uh, tells me this is not inspired scripture. And in particular, there's content in the book of Enoch that is in contradiction with what's in the 66 books of the Bible. So on that basis, I really don't give much credibility uh, to Jewish mythology about the Watchers or what I see in the book of Enoch on the same subject. Thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate your You're efforts welcome. and your and your movement and just everything that you do. Thank you so much. Um, I have the uh, Isaiah 38 question okay. about the, uh, the sundial going backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. That seems to break the laws of physics to uh, make the sundial go backwards. Um, I'm sure right. you're familiar with that and have spoken on it many times. Yeah, you can actually get a DVD from Reasons to Believe. It's called Mysteries Resolved or Mis... I forget the exact title, but Mysteries, you'll, you'll pick it up. And it's from our television show where we actually talked about uh, Isaiah's sundial and about Joshua's long day. We also talk about Jonah and the whale. It's all in that uh, one DVD. Uh, but with respect to Joshua or, or Hezekiah, uh, we have the sundial going back uh, 10 steps, which is equivalent to 40 minutes of time. And, uh, you know, as you read the account in, uh, in the book of Isaiah, uh, the Lord says, hey, I'll do a miracle for you to show that you really are going to get 15 more years of life. And Hezekiah says, well, it's easy to make the shadow go forward, make it go backward. What's interesting about that account, if you read on in Isaiah and in Chronicles where it's also recorded, you see that the uh, priests in Babylon saw the same miracle. And because of what they saw in Babylon, they sent a delegation to Jerusalem to investigate the miracle. What's interesting about that account, uh, here are the priests of Marduk in Babylon, and they see this miracle, and they say, well, this isn't our Marduk. He can't do that. Uh, let's go to Jerusalem where the real God is. So it's actually a testimony that the peoples and the nations around Israel realized that the real God was the one that was being worshipped by the Hebrews uh, in the land of Israel. And so they sent this delegation. Uh, what makes that a remarkable miracle is it's seen in two different sites 600 miles apart. And, uh, you know, I can explain the miracle of Joshua's long day by a local meteorological phenomena. Still a miracle, because uh, I've seen, I grew up in coastal British Columbia. You can get storms there that are so intense in the wintertime uh, that it gets dark like it is at night in the middle of the day. But to have that happen in the desert in Israel, because uh, the Valley of Ajalon is just outside Beersheba, it's a desert. And uh, yet it tells us it went dark uh, for a day. Now, some people interpret the text that it was light for an extra night, uh, but Hebrew scholars I've discussed this with have said in the original Hebrew, it's more likely to be an extended period of darkness rather than an extended period of light. So I can see God doing a meteorological miracle to make that happen. It's a little more challenging to make that happen in two sites separated by 600 miles. And so most Hebrew scholars I've discussed this with said, the, the interpretation they prefer is God's Shekinah glory shining upon the sundial to make the shadow go back as opposed to the sun causing it uh, to go back. Now, in terms of whether or not there is an actual time uh, discrepancy, that I can address as an astronomer uh, because you can look at a solar eclipse before Joshua's long day and a solar eclipse after Joshua's long day. And if there is like a 12 to 24 hour discrepancy, it'll show up in the data. The problem is this, the solar eclipse is recorded before uh, Joshua's long day. You'd, there's one in Egypt, for example. A solar eclipse happened in the land of Egypt today. Well, the, you know, today is plus or minus 12 hours. 
that's not enough to establish whether there's a time discrepancy. Moreover, when they say it happened in the Egyptian Empire, we have to pin down the location a lot more accurately than that. Now, once you get after Joshua's long day, people are now recording solar eclipses uh, to like plus or minus five minute precision, and they're getting the location. So there's actually the possibility of being able to establish whether there's a 40 minute discrepancy uh, for Hezekiah's sundial. And at the time of Hezekiah's sundial, they were recording solar eclipses to about plus or minus five minute precision and the location to about plus or minus 100 miles. And there's a paper published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society uh, in 1920 and 21 uh, by Fotheringham, you can look it up. And he tried to determine whether that discrepancy could be established. And he came up with, well, it looks like in the data there might be 38 minutes plus or minus 10. That's still not adequate to determine whether it was real or not. Bottom line is, there is no uh, evidence that we have that there is a time discrepancy. I say that because there's a rumor going around for 40 years that NASA scientists have used their computers to determine Joshua's long day and Hezekiah's 40-minute uh, discrepancy. Uh, there's no truth to that rumor. Uh, I've talked to the people at JPL, and they say, please help us get rid of this rumor. It's not true. Uh, Hugh, one from YouTube. Is there any physical evidence for a global flood? Any physical evidence for a global flood? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I got a whole chapter on that in uh, Navigating Genesis. <laughs> but I think what's more persuasive, the Bible itself refutes the possibility of a global flood. Second Peter 2, 5. A world of ungodly people was flooded. Second Peter 3, 5, and 6. The world that existed at that time was flooded. And this is where Peter's contrasting the world of Noah with the world of Rome. Because Paul makes statements about how he was able to spread the gospel throughout the whole world. He meant the Roman Empire. He was not referring to the Aborigines in Australia. And so we need to realize the Bible often uses terms like the whole world where it means less than planet Earth. You give many examples of that, uh, like Joseph fed the whole world. Well, he fed the Egyptian empire. That was the world of, uh, of him. Or like Solomon, his wisdom was spread throughout the whole world. And what's interesting about that is you actually read carefully uh, that account about Solomon. It says it was spread as far as Arabia and as far as Egypt. So it actually defines what the whole world and as far as Ethiopia. Ethiopia, Arabia, and Egypt was the whole world that heard of the wisdom of Solomon. So just recognizing uh, that today when we use the phrase the whole world, we mean the whole planet. That was not true of people that lived thousands of years uh, before us. But the strongest biblical evidence is in Psalm 104. Psalm 104 verses six, seven, and eight. And basically you need to understand Psalm 104 along with Job 37, 38, and 39, and Proverbs 8, uh, gives a review of the content of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 gives you the account of creation chronologically, but it doesn't give you all the scientific details. The Job account gives way more scientific details than you get in Genesis chapter 1. Psalm 104, likewise, gives us a lot of scientific details. And so you'll see the different aspects of the six creation days in Proverbs 8, uh, Job 37 to 39, and Psalm 104. But when Psalm 104 deals with creation day three, what you see in Psalm 104 verse six is when God transforms earth from a water world where there's only water on the surface of the earth to a planet where we got water and land. That's verses six, seven, and eight. Verse nine says, with the land now in place, water will never again cover the whole face of the earth. So right there is an explicit statement that water will never in the future cover the whole face of the earth, which means Noah's flood uh, could not be global. And uh, just for reassurance, there's three more Psalms that say the same thing, plus Proverbs 8, plus Job 38. 
So, and when I've done a debate with young earth creationists who believe in a global flood, they're aware of these passages, but their response is really interesting. They say, Hugh, you're citing the poetry of the Old Testament. And they claim that the poetry of the Old Testament can't be trusted to give didactic details. Here's my response to that. The book of Isaiah is almost entirely Hebrew poetry. And yet that Hebrew poetry gives us the most explicit, definitive statements of the doctrine of the Trinity. And we need to realize Hebrew poetry is a powerful tool for communicating didactic truth. Uh, it's not the same as English poetry. So just realizing that when the Hebrews wanted to really define things carefully, they more frequently used poetry than they used prose. And incidentally, what you learn at seminary in hermeneutics classes were to interpret the narrative passages of the Bible with the didactic passages. And so these wisdom books are actually really the place to go to correctly interpret the narrative of the creation text in Genesis 1 uh, through 11. Hi, I'm Evie, and I have a question. Um, how did dinosaurs live so long before humans in only 24 days? Okay. Hours. What about dinosaurs and humans? Well, again, I can go to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, the longest of the creation psalms, tells us that when God creates life, he creates it in great abundance and great diversity. And the principle you see there in Psalm 104, God is packing our planet with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, for as long as possible. Why? So that we humans can take advantage of a huge treasure chest of biodeposits. I mean, the fact that we're in this room today is possible because there's 76 quadrillion tons of biodeposits in the crust of the earth. Limestone, marble, uh, coal, oil, natural gas, topsoil, gypsum, all that was brought there because of the huge number of generations of life uh, that preceded us. And incidentally, even the metals, uh, the metals that we mine were concentrated by sulfate-reducing bacteria. So we're the beneficiaries of God packing the life. Now, the geography and the geology of the earth changes over its history. And so there were three periods in the past history of the earth when the continental land masses were covered by shallow seas. It's impossible to have creatures as big as the largest dinosaurs on the continents today. Why? Because without water support, uh, gravity will cause these animals to quickly injure themselves. Uh, the laws of physics tell us the biggest land animal you can have without water support is the elephant. So it's again a testimony to Psalm 104. God creates life with a maximum diversity. So today we got the largest animals in the face of the earth that the laws of physics will permit. But if you've got these shallow seas that are 10 to 50 feet deep, you can have land animals that are 80 feet long and weigh 80 tons because they can take advantage of the water to give them the necessary buoyancy that they're not going to injure themselves being subject to the law of gravity. Having said all that, how many of you have ever watched that movie, Jurassic Park? Okay. Almost all of you have. The, I, I had a hard time with that movie because it shows a T-Rex chasing this Jeep full of people at 45 miles an hour. An animal that big cannot run that fast without killing itself. I mean, one little trip and that animal is done. So, and if you watch elephants run, elephants can run fast, but they run in such a way as not to injure themselves. And that's one reason they got these big, huge uh, feet, is to make sure that they don't have that kind of injury. But if you've got these big, shallow seas, you can have these really large animals uh, that wander around. Uh, and for example, we have an animal in the face of the earth today bigger than any dinosaur. It's a blue whale. You know, 100 feet long, it weighs 200 tons, but it's totally supported by water. Uh, and the eras when we had those kinds of big, shallow seas, uh, were between uh, 245 million years ago and 66 million year years ago. 
Since that time, we've not had extensive shallow seas. And since that time, there's been no dinosaurs. Which creation day do they show up on? Creation day five. So creation day five is when you would have the dinosaurs. Creation day six, the shallow seas are gone, and that's the era when you got the birds and mammals. Uh, Hugh, I also really love the Jurassic Park movies, so oh, I'm, sorry. I'm having a hard time over here. Uh, uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes left, so we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Okay. Uh, just so you're aware of the time left to you. Uh, so another one from YouTube. What are your thoughts on near-death experiences? Okay, what are my thoughts on near-death experiences? I've had to deal a lot of those in my role as a pastor. And I kind of give people what I call the 95-5 rule. 90% of what people report to you as a near-death experience is not really a near-death experience. They're having a psychological experience or their brain is being starved of oxygen. And this explains when your brain is starved of oxygen, uh, you typically hallucinate. And so that counts for about 90%. But there's 5% uh, where it's really from God. And there's 5% where it's demonic. And so, like it tells us in 1 uh, John uh, chapter 3, we're to test the spirits to see where they're coming from. We're to test the human spirit. We're to test to see if it's the spirit of God. I will share this, however, is that uh, Gary Habermas is uh, working on a book, not on near-death experiences, but on the fact that when uh, a Christian dies, about a third of the cases, the surviving relatives have a vision that lasts five or six seconds. And the vision is basically the dead Christian saying, don't worry about me, I'm okay, I'm in a good place. The other thing Gary shared with me, it frequently happens, almost always happens, where there's surviving Christians have some doubt. Uh, did our uh, relative uh, really give his life to Christ or her life to Christ? And basically is a reassurance, don't worry. Now, it tells us in scripture that the dead cannot come back. However, I believe angelic beings can take the form of that and angels can do that. They can take whatever physical form or visual form that they want. So I think that's just one way of God basically giving the surviving relatives a reassurance. The fact that that happens so frequently tells us this is something spiritual that's going on. And so look for it. Gary's coming out with a book on that. Do we have time for one more? I think we'll probably get one or two more in. Okay. Thank you. Um, I love everything that you say. I wish I could have an hour just to talk to you. But uh, I know that in my feelings, the universe is, has a limit. I don't believe it just goes on and on. I believe on, on the other side as probably God's realm. But my question is, about the black hole. Now, I'm not sure if, you know, where that goes into, is that possibly through, can demons reach through that? Or, um, I know there's not a lot of knowledge about it, but can spirits get through that? And the CERN, all that? Just okay, good question. There's actually a chapter on black holes and wormholes and lights in the sky on Little Green Men. So I'll give a quick summary of that. And incidentally, I just had a paper published in the peer-reviewed literature, Black Holes as Evidence for God's Care. Uh, so if you put that into a search engine, it'll pop up and uh, you'll be able to read that. Uh, but as far as physical beings like us being able to travel through a black hole or a wormhole and come out into a different space-time realm, mathematically it's possible. Here's how it works. You got black hole A, black hole B. If the singularity of black hole A and black hole B perfectly touch one another and remain stable, you could travel from a space-time realm here through the wormhole and come out into a completely different space-time realm. That's been suggested as a way we could do time travel. But here's why it's not physically possible. Uh, 
the probability of getting the two singularities to perfectly touch one another is zero. The probability they would remain stable even if they did perfectly touch one another is zero. And nothing physical is going to survive going into the singularity of a black hole. Uh, and what I share in Licensed Sky Little Green Men, as you approach the event horizon of a black hole, you're going to notice yourself getting taller and taller and taller until you become a three mile long string of fundamental particles. <laughs> and then as you go into the event horizon, the particles all get destroyed. So uh, I would stay away from black holes and wormholes. <laughs> Okay, now could a spiritual being go through that? Yeah, spiritual beings like angels uh, are not subject to the laws of physics or space-time dimensions. They don't need wormholes. They've got other ways of going through. Uh, so yeah, they can do that. We can't. Back to you, Brian. Uh, we have time for one more question and we'll go ahead and uh, leave that to the in-person audience. Um, and I let people know on the stream, but if you have a question for Hugh and you didn't get a chance to ask it tonight or maybe you didn't want to get up, you can find him on Twitter or Facebook, and Hugh does try to respond to uh, his comments and questions on there. So uh, search him on social media if you have more questions. And by the way, that's true of all the scholars at Reasons to Believe. We all have ministry uh, Facebook pages and uh, Twitter pages, and we do take questions. We don't promise to answer all the questions, but we do the best we can. Hi, my name's uh, Forrest, and I remember, like, listening to you today made me remember something, a question I had in high school was learning about um, the moon Europa. Uh, uh, well, okay. Sorry, it was uh, about Jupiter's moon Europa. I remember learning about that in high school, and I remember that, I think it was NASA was wanting to do a expedition there. And I remember learning about this, and it was a big thing. They were talking about it a lot, and then it kind of seemed to disappear when they were thinking about um, doing the expedition to Mars and sending people to Mars, and I remember looking for it, and you couldn't really see anything about it, and so I was thinking about that today, and actually just looked it up, and that's why I came up, was I saw that they're reopening that, um, an expedition to Europa in 2024, because they think that it's made out of ice, and since it's by Jupiter, since it's constantly pulling and stuff, that there's an ocean underneath right, Europa, right. so they think that if they were going to find life in our solar system, that's where it would be, and I was wondering what your thoughts and stuff, would, if you heard, had heard about that. Right. Are. Well, um, my colleague Fazal Rana, our staff biochemist, the two of us wrote a book, Origins of Life, and I wrote the chapter on Europa, uh, basically making the point that there could be a liquid water ocean underneath the ice in Europa. Uh, but you run into what's called the oxidants non oxidants paradox. Uh, that uh, for life to originate, you can't have oxidants. Uh, but for life to survive, you must have oxidants. And we now know that the ice on Europa is at least 26 kilometers thick, which means oxidants that are produced on the surface of Europa are not going to be able to get into the interior. And, uh, but I'm aware that there's a mission to take a spacecraft to Europa, drill through the ice, and send a little probe down there and look for microbes. Here's what I've been sharing with my friends at NASA. Before you do that, it's an expensive mission. Before you do that, send a cheap mission uh, to Europa, a spacecraft that simply orbits Europa. Because this idea that there's a liquid water ocean in Europa is based on a calculation of the tidal heat that Europa gets from Jupiter. And uh, that data is pretty fuzzy. Uh, it may be there's ice all the way to the core. It could be slush. It could be liquid water. We don't know how much liquid water. Uh, it'd be a good investment just to send a spacecraft to orbit Europa, because if you do that, it'll tell you exactly what's going on in the interior. And if you find out it's ice all the way to the core, then you can forget about it. But I said, the real goal is to find microbes or the remains of life inside Europa, we already know because of the oxidants, uh, non-oxidants paradox, it's not there. So it's a, not a candidate. On the other hand, as an astronomer, I'd like to know about the interior of uh, Europa, but we don't have to send a $2 billion spacecraft there to do that. We can send something that costs $10 million, just orbit the thing and we'll get all the data we need. You're welcome. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Ross. Thank you for everybody who, uh, who sent in questions and who had questions here as well. Uh, one last reminder, over at the book table, again, these cards, one thing I forgot to mention, in the bottom corner, if you check off that box, then you can get on the email list for monthly meetings of our chapter, uh, which meet here on the second Monday in this church uh, of every month. So uh, feel free to fill it out. Not only do you get the, uh, the free book if you write send book, but you can also get on our list for monthly meetings here. We could find, you, then you know what the topics are and all. With that, I'm going to ask uh, Mark Taylor to come on up and close us in prayer. And this way we're still being faithful to the hour and a half time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you through the Lord Jesus. And Lord, thank you so much for uh, the last couple of days with uh, Hugh and just for his ministry and everyone else and uh, reasons to believe and just for everyone who's been able to come and hear about this. And, uh, and Lord, just um, most of all, just pray if there's anyone here um, who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they would uh, just be open to the gospel and seek someone out here to talk to about it and hopefully come to believe believe upon the Lord Jesus, and also, Lord, help all of us to be um, good witnesses for you out there in the world and to take some of these things um, that we've learned and just look for those opportunities um, to tell people about um, just the confirmations and evidence for you and your handiwork and for your revelation in the scriptures about, uh, about the Lord Jesus. And uh, Lord, I just really do pray for everyone here and their relationships and our safety and pray for all of our young people. Lord, in this world today, um, um, they'd come to know you as Savior, and then they would also just, um, again, be, uh, be learning, be getting this, this evidence in order that they um, will not only protect um, their own faith, but just be, be very strong witnesses for you. Amen. Amen. Have a good night. Have a safe trip home.